All right, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. If you could find a seat, please, I would appreciate it. So good morning and welcome. My name is Matias Valenzuela. I'm the manager for King County Equity and Social Justice. Uh, and thank you for coming this morning, taking time from your busy schedules. When we had, uh, this is our third annual um, uh, event that we do, our annual forum on equity and social justice. When uh, we did it last time, we had an excellent event and we said one of the goals was to really uh, fill up the room and uh, actually think we have done it. So um, I thank you very much. For, I want to acknowledge and um, just get a sense of everybody who's in the room just to see how uh, King County and some of our partners are here are represented. So I'm going to go quick down the list of departments and when I get to your department or office some of the offices are quite small just if you could stand up and raise your hand kind of like a wave going on in different places all right assessor's office yeah <laughs> council King County Council Ooh, thank you adult and juvenile detention all right community and human services in the house executive services all right. Judicial administration, natural resources and parks. Woo. All right. Transportation. Yeah. yeah. Okay, they're definitely the loudest. Uh, permitting and environmental review, uh, public defense. All right. Public health. Oh yeah. <laughs> District court. All right, elections. Great, executive's office. KCIT. <laughs> Economic, it's, this is a very small office. Economic forecasting and analysis, do we have it? Yay, all right. They have close to 100% participation. Uh, performance strategy and budget. Yay. Prosecuting attorney's office. We have some people over there. They're kind of shy. They're not as loud as transportation and public health. The sheriff's office. Also there. Thanks for coming. Superior court. Yeah. And then if you're, uh, this was mainly um, for uh, King County agencies and, and, um, and our employees, but we also got inquiries from some community partners and other jurisdictions. So if you're from a community partner organization or other jurisdiction, if you can stand up, we can acknowledge you and thank you for coming. All right. So I, as, I, as I was saying, this is our third annual forum. Um, this time, you know, in the last two sessions, we really actually focused more on community conditions and um, how we could advance equity in the community. This time around, we're actually um, turning our eyes into ourselves here and going more deeply and looking at the issues of implicit bias, racial anxiety, stereotype threat, and seeing how we got here, the research and why we all um, carry these with us, um, and then how they relate to our workforce, our workplace, um, and then getting into some of the things that we can do about this. Um, King County Executive wanted to be here, was planning to be here, but I think the only thing that would trump him being here today would be something like being invited to the White House, um, and that's actually what happened. But he wanted to uh, address everybody this morning, so going to just show a uh, welcome from him. Good morning and welcome to the 2014 Equity and Social Justice Forum. I'm unable to join you here this morning because I'm at the White House at an early education summit, which is central to our effort to ensure that every baby born and every child raised in King County has the opportunity to fulfill his or her potential. As we turn our commitment into action here at King County and incorporate equity and social justice into every aspect of the work we do as a local government, it is important that we first embrace inclusion within our own organization. Today's forum will help us address our own individual biases, and yes, we all have them, so that we have the healthy and inclusive workplace and workforce we need to achieve our goal of a more equitable society. It will also help us improve the way we connect and communicate with residents in our increasingly diverse communities. 
The recent tragedy and fallout from Ferguson, Missouri adds even greater urgency to the work we're doing to ensure that everyone in our region, regardless of race or where they live, has the opportunity to succeed in life. This effort will require a long-term commitment and a willingness to rethink the way we provide services with a focus on outcomes. But thanks to the work you do each day, we are making steady progress. Our reduced bus fare program and our combined effort to help nearly 200,000 King County residents enroll under the Affordable Care Act are just two examples of how we are delivering on our promise to expand opportunities in our region. I want to thank each of you for what you do to make sure that King County remains one of the most prosperous regions in the nation. You are the ones who turn our priority into action. Thanks for being here. All right. So um, also wanted to announce that as, actually as of today, King County, we're joining the Within Our Lifetime campaign, which is a campaign to end uh, racism. And this is part of our uh, efforts. And the latter part of uh, the session today, you'll hear from a, a group of uh, our colleagues about um, some follow-up things that we want to do. So it just doesn't stop here uh, today. I want to introduce my uh, two uh, co-chairs for the Interbranch Team for Equity and Social Justice, uh, Keir Shihak and Ngazi Olaru. And as they come up also, if we could ask actually Interbranch Team members, if you could just stand up really quickly so um, people can see who you are. So these are the folks throughout the county who are representatives from each uh, department and agency to really support the work that you are doing within um, your departments and agencies. And now, of course, there are teams within each department and agency as well. But with that, turning it over to Karen Ngazi. Thanks. Hi, Ngazi. Hello. Good morning, Carrie. Good morning. Hi, everybody. Good morning. It's great to see you all here. Yeah, public health. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to see every executive department here <laughs> and our separately elected agencies too. Um, so I think it's really great. I feel really fortunate myself to work in a place where um, we're really unpacking these issues. And as the executive said, you know, we all have biases. And um, a couple of years ago, I learned about this uh, tool online called the Implicit Associations Test which tests your biases, and I took it. What did you find out? Well, uh, I found out that I have a, what's called an automated preference for whites. Wow. Yeah, it's a pretty uncomfortable thing to find out about yourself. Why is that? Well, you know, I think we all really want to deliver uh, on our promise of equity in the county, and. You know, I look at you, my friend, my colleague, and I, it's, just, it, it, it's just a really uncomfortable feeling. And I know that you read the book Blind Spot, right? Which is Yes, I did. Similar. And I didn't finish it. Why didn't you finish it? Really? Because I, in the middle of it, I got so upset. Yeah. I could not finish it. And um, I did take the test, too. Oh, you did? Yeah. I did. And what did you find out? The same reason why I couldn't finish the book. Mm -hmm. um, I was afraid to find out. And what I was afraid of happened. Mm -hmm. I actually do also have an automatic uh, bias against black people. Wow. Against myself. Wow. So, um, you know, goes along the same lines of uh, internalized oppression. Yeah. And uh, the test actually yeah. confirmed that. Yeah. It's harder for me to understand what that must feel like, but it must be really, really tough feeling. It's a, it's a, it's a very hard place to be, but yeah. I'm happy also to know that. Yeah. Because what it helps me do. And I hope what it helps all of us do is not just the finding out, it's the what now do I do about it. Right. And I'm hoping that this session is going to help us uh, learn some tools. I know. I was really excited when we were talking to Rachel earlier this morning because she was 
uh, we had a chance to just talk to her a little bit, and she was talking about all this new research around the brain and how you know we not only know that we all hold these biases, but now there's actually things that we can actively do yeah. to combat them, and that's what we really want to do. That's yeah, what we really and then do. The, the other piece of it, at least for me, is um, I feel fortunate that I am in a workplace where as a white woman and as a black woman, we can actually have yeah. a conversation about it. And I don't feel it's a difficult conversation. I feel it's a conversation that we should have. And the more that we talk about it, the, the better we yeah. can work on, we can use the tools we're going to learn yeah. today. I have to tell you, Ngozi, it's been so important to me as a white person to have you as a black ally so that we can really yes, and, talk and about Yes, and that's stuff. the thing, that we're moving towards allyship. Yeah. And uh, it's my ally. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, with that, with that, you want to answer this, Rachel, or should I? Go ahead. You want me to do it? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, so uh, we're really excited, uh, as we said, to have Rachel Godsill here today. She's a professor at law, a professor of law at Seton Hall in New York and she's the director of research at the Perception Institute. Oh, I get to do that? You do. <laughs> All right, and she was appointed chair of the Rent Guidelines Board for the City of New York. Professor Godsill has also worked with, uh, within our lifetime campaign, which Matthias referenced, and the national campaign to uh, end racism, which I actually believe we can do. This is truly a, an, an incredible honor to be uh, one of the speakers at an event held by King County. Uh, working with the, the, the group and with Matthias and Paula and Aaron has been really instructive about what a team of people, and I've now learned there are other folks in the planning committee, I keep getting these wonderful notes, the planning committee suggests you should do, and they're all very, very thoughtful. Um, this is a group who clearly is putting immense effort into thinking about how all of you, as people working on the ground, doing the incredibly varied work that you do, uh, can achieve at the equity and social justice goals to which you aspire. I've spent the last six years uh, immersing myself in the social sciences. As, as, the, as the folks who introduced me mentioned, I'm a law professor. And before that, I was a civil rights litigator. And as a civil rights litigator, one of my questions was always, how do we understand why, starting when I graduated from law school in 1992, how do we understand how there's such incredible differences in perspective in the role that race and ethnicity and gender, and at the time sexual orientation wasn't on the table, it obviously is now, and keep creating obstacles to people's engagement, involvement, opportunities, when we know that the law and our general stated aspirations and what we say that we believe suggests that we should be in a different place. And obviously with the election of President Obama, many people thought we really were just transcending it all and moving into a different place. And recent tragedies make quite clear that we're not yet there. Um, but as, uh, as it's been suggested, the mind sciences have some potential to help give us some tools that we didn't know about before. So just to begin, when I read through the report that was just issued by, by your uh, office this year, it is truly inspiring to think about the work that's been done to identify the structural conditions and the structural obstacles that different communities face to sort of swimming in the, you know, the healthy stream of equity. And that's a beautiful, beautiful image and a beautiful metaphor. And to start with that aspiration and to start with the notion that I'm presuming every person in this room wants to be part of having everyone be in that stream of equity, and truly believing that that's where everyone here is, turns out to be a key component of actually moving toward a place where we can achieve that. Because one of the challenges that we face is it's really hard to look around and see the continuing obstacles, to see the continuing differences in opportunity that race and gender and ethnicity suggest that exist, and to actually believe that the person sitting next to you wants it to be different. 
but the work that's going into your county government suggests your county government really does want it to be different. And the next question is, if everyone really does want it to be different, why is it so hard? And that's where the looking inward is crucial. And that's where the mind sciences and the decades of work that psycho social psychologists and neuroscientists have all been doing in their laboratories can actually be translated into the work that you all do in these incredibly important areas. So I thought I would begin with something obvious. It's in the room. There is immense ra racial polarization on the question of the current, you know, sort of public awareness of deaths of primarily African American men, but not always, at the hands of the police. People seem, despite, again, a general overall sense that race shouldn't affect who lives or dies, which, again, very few people think otherwise, and yet we see these immense racial differences in the response. And I'll, now, of course, I'm just focusing on Ferguson, although I'm coming to you from New York. And as many of you probably know, if you're focusing on the news, New York, despite the election of a mayor who ran on a campaign focused to a large degree on his knowledge as a parent, white man, but a parent of a black son, and a parent of a black son who he worries about what will happen when he goes out at night. So Mayor de Blasio has you know, as deep-seated a sense of fear and empathy for everyone who's in the situation of worrying about the health of their children, the, the likelihood of their child having an experience at the hands of police officers who are there to protect our communities. That sort of tension between the necessity of our police officers to protect our communities and yet the possibilities that I don't feel. When I see a police officer, I am delighted because I am, have never been treated in any way other than respectfully and helpfully. You know, they are my friends. And I think we all know that police officers, of course, want to be able to protect all in all communities, and yet we see what happened in Ferguson, we see the outcome of the grand jury decision in Ferguson, and then we see that whites, particularly, and African Americans have extraordinarily divergent responses to that, and that's in the case in New York. I know you have a situation here in Seattle as well. So that's in this room, right? That's in this room. We look at those numbers, and you look around the table, and it's hard to talk about when something is this fraught and when something causes this much pain. Uh, some of you may have seen an article written by a friend of mine, Sophia Simmons, African-American woman living in DC, whose husband is a police officer and who has a black son. And she wrote a piece after the Ferguson decision where she said she literally feels ripped in half because she knows what it's like to worry about her husband when he goes out at night and her child is five but she's worrying about the day when she has to worry about him too. So we're in this moment, this really challenging moment, where thinking about the role that race plays in life or death situations is something that confronts us all, and yet for many whites, this seems really surprising, sort of, it seems kind of evident that be respectful to police officers and it'll all be okay. And part of what we'll talk about as we go forward is how did it come to be that people can share general values, general positive values of wanting everyone to be in that stream of equity, and yet experiencing something like the outcome in Ferguson so very, very differently. And how we can reach a point where seeing through each other's eyes allows us to move forward, and that is the goal of today. So moving from Ferguson, and again, this is something obviously we could spend kind of the day talking about, but this is a county government that has an extraordinary range of areas of, effort, of focus, of areas of effort, of places where a difference can be made. So I'm gonna to move to an area where I think we can kind of all come together. Everyone wants there to be a phenomenal education for every child. We know we want that because it's the right thing, because we love kids. Uh, if we wanna think economically and make the big business case for equity, we know it's good for economic opportunity in our communities, in this county. So we all want that to be. And actually, in King County, there's some really interesting news. One of the things that I focus a great deal on is we need to 
share both internally and particularly, frankly, externally, where there is good news. One of the, one of the actual ways in which uh, racial equity and uh, you know, kind of equity throughout ethnicities can be undermined is if people have a skewed sense of where progress can be made and has been made, and if people have a skewed sense of where the differences lie. And I'll talk about that more. But so if you look at this slide, one thing that's really interesting, and, and, and I'll, I'll share these slides so you can all look at them more carefully. If you see African American kids are coming into kindergarten ready to go. African American kids and white kids are actually in language development and literacy uh, in, in pretty similar places, almost identical. Now, obviously, work to do uh, with, uh, with Pacific Islander uh, kids and American Indians and Alaska Natives, there's work to do. It's interesting to note that Asian American kids are coming into kindergarten more similarly situated to Pacific Islander kids than they are to African American kids and white kids. So it's just interesting to note that. But what this tells us is we've got a snapshot of where kids of color are when they come into kindergarten. And families, all of whom want their kids to do well. With respect to what happens once kids get to school and what happens during those years of schooling, you know, again, much more data that could be shown, there's a mixed picture of success. So on the one hand, and again, I'm, I, I think it's really important to share positive outcomes so that people can see possibilities both for those who don't look like them and for themselves. Very interesting to note that 61.2% of African American high school graduates go on to college, very close to the percentage of white kids. Interesting when we think about our previous slide, what the percentages of Asian and Pacific Islander kids are who go on to college after they graduate from high school. We see some big jumps. Clearly, an enormous amount of work needs to be done with Latino kids and American Indian Alaska Native kids. So we see work that needs to be done. Hard to see that other slide. That other slide tells us a very different story. That slide tells us about the percentage of kids who are suspended and expelled. And number four, the largest percentage, 14%, are African American. So we're seeing uh, next largest, 13%, American Indian. Smallest, Asian Pacific Islander, close to that, white. So we're seeing all sorts of different, you know, sort of numerical outcomes that tell us different things about what's happening in the school system that we need to be aware of to think about the why. Why would it be that these kids who come into kindergarten ready to go, ready to learn, so enthusiastic, end up with the highest suspension rates? This is certainly not unique to Seattle, or to King County, rather. This is a national data, and this is national data looking at the differences in suspension rates from the early 70s, not halcyon days from my memory, to, to, uh, to, to the 2000, 2000, uh, 2009, 2010 years, which is the data they had in front of them. And again, obviously, the first thing we see is the unbelievable increase in the percentage of kids uh, suspended. We also see the unbelievable racial differences in who is suspended from schools. Now, some might ask, well, perhaps kids are engaging in different behavior. Perhaps there are explanations for why these suspensions occur. I don't think any of us would doubt, I certainly don't think, that people who go into the teaching profession go into the teaching profession with any intention of engaging in racially disparate treatment. I have a very hard time believing that. And yet what we learn when we dig deep into the justifications for the suspensions that we see and the expulsions that we see, it's not because, just focusing for a minute on African Americans, it is in fact not because African American kids are fighting at much higher level or who are bringing in you know, weapons at much higher level. It's actually for much more ambiguous reasons. Disrespect or loitering. So we know something other than kids are behaving differently is part of the picture and is part of what we need to think about. 
keeping in mind, and I, again, I believe this with every ounce of my being, that this is not an outcome teachers want. And when teachers hear this outcome, it is extraordinarily distressing to them. I've talked to principals who said, when I talk to, te talk to my teachers about race and the role race plays, and they're white, and it, I raise the idea that we're seeing racial differences in our schools, they cry. And that those tears are, you know, despair at what they don't want to happen. Undoubtedly, there's some guilt. Again, I'm a white woman. I know what white guilt feels like. And I know I have cried too. And I know that my tears aren't helpful. No child is helped because I'm crying. What needs to happen is diagnosing and figuring out what's leading to the differences and being allies, joining together and doing the work. What we also know, and I'll talk about this a little bit, the traditional measures of capacity and learning for kids of color are inadequate. They are, have been estimated by a meta-analysis of hundreds of studies by some uh, uh, social psychologists from Stanford to represent approximately 62 points on the SAT. Those of you who have high school level or just have kids who go through the college application process know that 62 points in the LSAT is huge. That's, I, I see some nods, I'm seeing some parents who, or some folks who likely have kids or, or siblings or someone who's gone through this, this is huge. So what we know is kids of color's capacities are not being accurately measured. And that means they're being told and others are seeing them as not as capable as they are. And we need to figure out all the tools, use every tool at our disposal to make sure that's not so. What we also find out, that there's a specter of the sort of biased teacher, whether it's implicit, you know, in the old days it would have been kind of the explicitly biased teacher. Currently, more people, I think, are willing to, to, to accept that most teachers have conscious egalitarian values, but may hold implicit biases, and that's true. So there's the, there's the specter of the teacher who fails to recognize the successes and possibilities and capacities of kids of color, and that's real. But there's another phenomena that is also deeply harmful to our children, and that's findings that teachers sometimes don't give the critical feedback that kids of color need. They, they, they withhold that criticism, and they overpraise because they don't want to seem like they're racist. That's like my tears. That doesn't help kids. Kid, we all know that kids need to hear where they need to improve. They need to hear it in ways that they can hear, and I'll talk about that, but they need to hear that. And for teachers to withhold out of a, I want to make sure that I'm protecting this child and not making him or her feel bad, that's not the work that we need to do. Again, that's white guilt. That's not proactive working toward giving kids the tools that they need. So what we have to figure out are what are the dynamics that lead to these very con this very confusing picture. Now one thing that's exciting about being here in King County is you, this county government has clearly recognized the structures and the policies that can be impediments to equity outcomes. The, the reports that you've written, the Areas of concern that you've identified from a structural level are phenomenal. They're, they're absolutely excellent. You've had Manuel Pastor, you've had Maya Wiley, you've had everyone in this room, you've had people working together to identify structurally what needs to be different, and that's fantastic. That is absolutely necessary. But what the mind sciences tell us is it's not sufficient. In order for the structures and the policies to translate into real change. That needs to happen person by person. That needs to happen within the institutions, between the institutions and the community, and there needs to be a context in which the structures and the policies can translate every day. And that's where bringing the implicit bias and the racial anxiety and the stereotype threat mind science work to all of you, I'm hoping, can supplement and complement the amazing work you've done in identifying structures and policies so that that structural and policy work will lead to success. Because the, the concern we all have, I think, when we're talking about doing work on race and ethnicity is 
in some sense, and this is true, there's been an awareness, of course, of these challenges for decades. And so some people wonder, we've been doing this for years and nothing changes. Why? Part of the reason is because there was a great deal we didn't know, again, about why the work is hard. And that's what the Mayan sciences can help tell us. Now, explicit bias does, of course, continue to exist. There are people who do adhere to the negative stereotypes about different groups. And to the extent that that's true, to the extent that there may be people in any workplace who do adhere to explicitly biased points of view, the hope is that the combined work will change that and they will you know, sign on to the affirmative, uh, you know, sort of egalitarian attitudes that virtually you know, all of you, most of you in this room hold. But frankly, if there are standards of practice that everyone in a workplace has to engage in, even if someone enters that with some explicit stereotypes that they haven't let go of yet, they can still be held accountable to certain behaviors, and it's the behavior that matters most. Hearts and minds are crucial, but for the work to be done for our kids, for, for our seniors, for our communities, it's what we do that matters most. So I would say identify the behaviors that we want to see, identify the practices that have to happen, and frankly, usually, the attitudes will follow. But it's this, again, it's this notion that most people have done the conscious work. It's the unconscious, for the most part, that's the challenge for, for us all. So the, two, the three areas I'm going to talk about most are these multiple racial dynamics that occur internally, that when they bump up against the structures and when they enter into our institutions, they can really impede, undermine, or make unbelievably challenging the effective implementation of all the amazing goals that are set forward in your reports and in the executive orders, etc. But for a second, we're going to step back. Because in order to do the mind science work, we actually need to experience our brains in action. So I've seen this as a, this is a wonderful vocal group. I'm going to look for the traffic folks and uh, the, the natural resources folks particularly, but I want everyone involved. So what, I, what I'm going to need from everyone in this room is for everyone vocally, as this wonderful gentleman just did, to please state when I press my button the color of the text as quickly and as loudly as you can, full group. Everyone ready? Okay. First. What happened? What happened? You know, a part of me would think, a part of me would think that you're sick of me already, and you're like, I'm not going to do what she says. I'm going to, you know, once I got to, once I got to, after the green that's in green, forget it. I'm not going to do what she said. But actually, I believe that all of you wanted to do what I requested, which is to state the color of the text. But the minute that we got to the black text, the black red, <laughs> the minute that we got to the text that says R-E-D, which of course spells red, and it's in black, everyone said red, right? Because you are automatically, every single person in this room is automatically conditioned to read what you see. And you've been conditioned that way since you were in my era, maybe first or second grade, in our kids' era, what, preschool, they start reading? You know, so we've been conditioned to read what we see. And what you just experienced, the fancy word for it, is automaticity. You just experienced your automatic, implicit, unconscious brain overriding your conscious intention of being a wonderful audience and doing what I ask. You just experienced automaticity. So what does that have to do with race? Again, kind of amusing, nice little break. It has everything to do with race. Because you saw your brain in action. You saw that the work that the brain has learned to do over a lifetime of both explicit instruction from your teachers and just practice. You walk around and you read street signs. You walk around and you, know, you see descriptions of where you ought to go, and you read it, and it's what you do. 
So our unconscious brain is unbelievably powerful, and usually if there's a war between our unconscious and our conscious brains, and we're moving quickly, our unconscious brain wins. Now, if I went back and went very slowly, we all could have nailed it, right? But when you go quickly, your unconscious brain wins. So it's real, it's, again, it's a wonderful exercise. It's called the Stroop Test, and it's actually something social psychologists use all the time because it's such a vivid experience of our brains in action. So what, is our un, what, are, what does our brain do? What our brain does is it takes all the stimuli that we have in front of us all the time, it sorts it into categories. So objects, sort of I know, uh, and this is my favorite new one actually, is if there's a little square thing or whatever the shape of the, of the, I, of the iPhone, if there's something like that that's making even a, 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 like a, a sound that just starts suddenly, even if it's a song, if it's a bell, I know to pick it up and answer it because I know it's a phone. That's a new category in my head, is, a, is, a, is an iPhone or is, is, a, is a cell phone. When I was a kid, I would have thought it was a really cool, very small, newfangled radio. Because when we were, many of us were kids, I think most of us are kids, there's nothing existed like an iPhone. My phone was the large, you know, mine actually had the, the rotary, remember the rotaries? You know, we had a party line. I mean, our kids, my kids, like when I describe my experience of phones, it's just shocking to them. But, <laughs> But we all know now what to do if something like that's ringing. We press the button, we pick it up, and we talk on it. We don't think about it. We don't hesitate. We know what to do. So our brains have categories of knowledge that we absorb that allow us to know exactly what to do. We have associations that are sort of describe what constitutes a particular thing, and that's what I meant with the cell phone. So in my day, a phone had certain things associated with it. It had a cord. It had a little squiggly attachment from the earpiece to the piece that you dialed, those are no longer associated with the category of phone, but the new category has won out. What also happens is our brains fill in gaps when all the information isn't present. My daughter is, uh, is a ballet dancer and she was in uh, the Nutcracker show last year and she was an angel. And all the angels had these beautiful wings and they you know, did, danced out, did their little dance. And I, in one of the dances, that she, one of the performances, I noticed her face looked a little tense. And I was going to yell at her to smile afterward. Luckily, I didn't say anything because she came up and said, Mommy, did you notice I didn't have my wings? It's like, I didn't actually notice at all that you didn't have your wings. I just thought you weren't smiling. So my brain filled in the wings. And everyone else's brains did too because you expected to see them. So this is the work that our unconscious brain does, and it's, again, powerful. It has evolutionary origins, and it's what allowed us as a species to survive. So this picture helps us see sort of how large the proportion of our brains are that are automatic. And it also refers to an important part of our brain that you know, anyone who talks about implicit bias always mentions, the amygdala. The amygdala is the portion of the brain that registers fear. And obviously, the portion of our brain that registers fear has to be quick. It has to be quick in order to protect us. So knowing that we have this powerful automatic brain that is unconscious, that can be contrary to our conscious intentions and goals, can begin the work of helping us understand how our implicit unconscious brain can link to race. So these schemas that I talked about, I've, got, I've given you wings, I've given you cell phones, they're also associated with people. So we have categories of people, we have children, we have elder, we have man, woman, white, black, Catholic, and with each of these categories of people, we make certain associations. Now let's take child for a second, because the category of child, for the most part, is not a controversial one. We know that children, particularly small children, we need to protect them. We know there are decisions that they make that they can't be trusted to make. Again, I'm a New Yorker, and so if I see a child going toward the subway platform, it's a little bit like this one, uh, if I see a child going that way, my reaction, appropriately, would be to reach out and pull the child back and to pick the child up. And I would be a hero, and I would be on the front of the New York Post in a positive way. However, there are people, adults, 
who are about the size of a fairly young child. There was a woman in my, in my kid's school who was a small adult, and she was the size of my child when she was in third grade. If I were, to, and adults all the time go to the subway and look like this, if when a small adult made that move, I picked her up and pulled her back, that would be assault and battery. I mean, it would, an unwanted touching, and very offensive. And yet, it's important that I generally be able to have my associations with certain categories of people in order to function. Now, we know there are positive associations that we make with categories of people, and what we also know are that not all of us make the same positive associations with the same categories. And this is one of the challenges, because we know there are negative associations we make of categories of people, and these are all done unconsciously. We also know that these associations of people, just like objects, change. So the picture that I have on the left is a 19th century picture of an English woman versus an Irish woman. I'm Irish Catholic, so I tend to make lots of references to the experience of Irish Catholics, because I think, actually, the change that has occurred with respect to associations and stereotypes about the Irish can be instructive. Not the same for current categories of uh, groups who are experiencing stigma, who are experiencing obstacles based upon their race or ethnicity, but instructive. In the 19th century, the Irish were considered savage. Not by all, obviously, but by the dominant culture. They were, we were considered savage. We were considered ape-like, as this picture suggests, violent, uneducable. These all, needless to say, precluded the Irish from a lot of life opportunities, made it very easy for them to be segregated into portions of cities. If you're just reading about Five Points in New York, which was you know, sort of an Irish ghetto, it was one of the sort of first slums. Um, Dickens found it completely abhorrent, and he blamed it all on the Irish. Um, so, but we know those stereotypes and associations, for the most part, have disappeared. Now people, you know, everyone's Irish on St. Patrick's Day. You associate Irish with, you know, shamrocks and maybe U2. Um, it, again, if you're from my generation or older, there might be some memories of being Irish Catholic as literally seeming to be an obstacle to political office. But frankly, with the election of John F. Kennedy going forward, most of that has abated. But as I'll tell you, for me, in some instances, not all, but in some, my Irish Catholic working class roots are actually salient, and they affect me. And because they can be salient for me, that can have effects on my experience in certain contexts. If this, were, if, if this wonderful audience were on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, and everyone here were a very wealthy Upper East Side socialite, and you all had straight blonde hair and pearls, and really fancy outfits, I would be very different. Because that's a group for whom my Irish Catholic roots makes me feel really out of place. I would not be funny. I would be kind of like this. Because I have a certain level of stereotype threat with respect to that group, and we'll talk about that. So another exercise that I need group participation. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? Go! Another example of this is another example of how our brain's automatic functioning makes it more challenging to be constantly attuned to everything at once, and therefore means we notice some things but not others. What we notice often is linked 
to what our expectations are. What our expectations are, are often rooted in stereotypes. So this gets us finally to what implicit bias is. So bias, you, you know that word. Um, explicit, being aware of your evaluation of a person. Implicit, it's when it's automatic and you don't know that you have it. So an implicit bias is an automatic association of stereotypes or attitudes with a particular group and its members. That's the formal definition of implicit bias. And so what we mean when we say someone has implicit bias is they make automatic associations that they don't know they have. And that's why when we talk about implicit bias, we are not accusing someone of consciously having hatred or consciously holding stereotypes because many people, it turns out most people in this country have some implicit biases that they find abhorrent, absolutely abhorrent. And that's why I don't recommend that everybody take what I'm going to describe now, the implicit association test, uh, before coming to a training because it's confusing otherwise. So stereotypes, traits associated with a particular group, attitudes, warmth or coldness toward a particular group. We can have positive stereotypes and negative attitudes, right? So many, frankly, uh, people think of positive stereotypes with respect to Asian Americans, but sometimes there are implicit negative or ambivalent attitudes that are to some degree associated with those positive stereotypes, you know, out of certain implicit jealousy or fear. With respect to Jews, historically, there's often been certain positive stereotypes but negative attitudes. With respect to the elderly, we have very positive attitudes, much, a lot of warm feelings, but the level of implicit assumptions of incompetence are higher than any other implicit bias level, higher than any other one. So it's, again, these are, these are different. Now we know that the stereotypes and attitudes we have can deeply affect how we think about government policy and programs. So here's one example. This is an iconic picture from the Depression era of a, woman, you know, of, of a single mother with her children. When there was an assumption that single women with their children were white, there was an enormous amount of empathy and concern and compassion toward that group that led to government programs that supported them. That image, the image of a single woman with her children, has changed. It is now racialized. And whatever we think about particular government programs, the picture that comes to mind for many when we think about single mothers and their children are primarily African American, which is wildly ironic because there are far more white women at home single without a man in the home with their children, far more than there are African American because they're just more white people. But that's not the picture that we have. And what that means is White women with their children have always received more of these government benefits than black women with their children, but somehow that's not known. And it's interesting how that happens. So here's an example of how ideas about kind of who fits into a particular category can actually confuse us. This is taken from one of the reports uh, that, that, the, 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 uh, reports that have come out of your government uh, agency, and this tells us the percent of racial or ethnic groups below the poverty level in King County. Now, the percent of the racial or ethnic groups below the poverty level, the highest level, as we can see, is African American. Second highest level is Latino. Most people in looking at this table would think that most poor people in King County were black or Latino. But it's not true. There are so many more white people in King County than there are black people or Latinos that most poor people or the highest number are white. The next highest are Latino by a very, look at that margin, that's huge. So if you're thinking about the pure numbers, there are many more white people then there are Latinos or African Americans who are poor, but somehow we never know that. 
because the way information is communicated to us t focuses on the groups who are disproportionately poor, and from a policy perspective, we must know that, and we must think about why that is and implement policies that will address that, but it's also really important for the public to know with respect to stereotypes and associations, there are a lot of white poor people. And there are a lot of people of color who are working middle, upper class. Why is that important? Because we need to break apart these stereotypes. And we need people to understand we're all benefiting from government programs. There's not makers and takers among racial or ethnic groups. We're all benefiting, we're all contributing. And this is something that as county government employees, really important to think about. The stereotypes do really dangerous work. And we need to think about how inadvertently, with the best of intentions, we may contribute to them. Okay, so how do we measure bias? Um, so the implicit association test, which I will share the, or you know, I'm sharing a facilitator guide that will share a link and give you a lot more information about it. But this is a test that was created uh, by a social psychologist actually in Washington, uh, Anthony Greenwald, that was initially created with flowers and bugs. His initial idea was, I want to see if my conscious brain can override my unconscious brain. And I know that I love flowers and I loathe bugs, particularly cockroaches. So I'm going to see if I can as quickly kind of convince myself to press a button associated positive words with the cockroaches as I can positive words with the flowers, and similarly, positive words with, I'm sorry, negative words with flowers as negative words with the bugs. He could never do it. So it's a little computer exercise where you're told which button to press when you see, you know, so you've got flower over here, cockroach over here, beautiful. You're supposed to press left and flower in one exercise, right and bug in the other exercise, and Tony Greenwald and everyone in his office, no one, except for the kid who always loved bugs, no one could ever as quickly make those associations. It's kind of like you know, our color test. If something is very strongly ingrained in your implicit mind and you're moving quickly, it can be very difficult to move equally quickly if you have what they call schema consistent, you know, flowers pretty, bugs disgusting, Schema consistent, that's easy, you move fast. Schema inconsistent, you tend to move more slowly to try and make the button press. So let's then, as they did, link that to race and ethnicity or to gender. And it turns out that most people have a more difficult time associating positive words with the non-dominant group. So with respect to whites and African Americans. What the research tells us, and I'm going to go back in a second, implicit bias is pervasive. I'm just going to give an example of judges. I've been doing a lot of judges, judicial trainings. 87% of white judges showed implicit preferences for whites. These are federal judges. Now, some people will say, well, don't people just feel more positively about their own group? Isn't this just evolution? Isn't this just, you know, nationalism? Isn't this just normal? Well, it's interesting. Only 44% of black judges showed an implicit preference for blacks. If this were just, I'm positive about people who look like me, we would expect those numbers to be the same. But they're not. And they are not in every single country in the world, in the sense that every country in the world has dominant identity groups and groups that historically have been stigmatized. And in every single country, the dominant group tends to feel, you know, sort of have a far faster level of association of positive words with itself and is slower to associate positive words with the non-dominant group. So that's the implicit association test. What is it not? It is not a DNA test. It is not a fixed number that tells you who you are and what you're capable of. It can change. It's Again, it's an exercise that tells us, particularly when it's been done by millions of people, which it has, something important about our society that we have to think about, but it isn't something that tells 
any given individual who they are. A bunch of lawyers, when this first came out, wanted to kick every person who had implicit biases off a jury. That's ridiculous. <laughs> because if you move slow, if you think, you can override these unconscious associations. You can. You just have to know to do it. And that's one of the challenges. People are so afraid to think of themselves as having bias that they don't venture into the possibility that they may, and so they don't feel like they have to move as slowly, and it turns out we really do. So here's a recent example of implicit bias in action, and you see what you expect to see. And this one has lawyers absolutely going insane. So an, a, a memo was written that was intentionally kind of fine but not great, that intentionally had seven spelling or, gra or grammatical errors embedded within it. Half of the law firm partners were told that the person who'd written the memo was a white guy who'd gone to NYU named Tom Meyer. The other half were told it was an African-American guy named Tom Meyer who went to NYU. Now you'll see a couple of the comments which you know, sort of definitely trigger all of our buttons. We see generally good writer but needs to work on, needs a lot of work, uh, has potential, most uh, you know, sort of most rhetorically distressing, can't believe he went to NYU. Now what's that about? I think we know. I think it's actually most notable, however, because those could be cherry picked, right? This is a consultant study, those could be cherry picked. I think it's most notable to look at the average number of spelling and grammatical errors found when the partner thought that the associate was white, you know, 2.9 uh, 2 uh, out of 7, versus the number found when they thought he was black, almost 6 out of 7. So why would it be that the partners would find virtually every single spelling and grammatical error when they think he's black, but only a couple when they think he's white? What do you think? Because they were looking for them. The first time they saw, when they saw that first one, put them on notice. Suddenly, there's a concern. Is this person capable? Is this person someone I want at my firm? Now, let's be clear. Law firm partners have every reason, both economic and hopefully kind of moral, political, to want to have diverse firms. But they have serious economic reasons for wanting diversity in their firms. So there are a lot of corporations that will give business to law firms that have greater levels of successful diversity. So these are people who have reason to want to find excellent associates of color. And yet, what we see is they are not, contrary to their own expectations of themselves, able to purely judge on the merits. We all think we can, but you know, the old adage, I've got to be twice as good, it's almost exactly the case here, right? Almost exactly the case. And this is something, of course, that people of color and sometimes women fear most. I've got to be twice as good. They're going to find every mistake I make, and I'm going to be judged in a way that someone who's part of the do a dominant group won't. Another example of implicit bias at work, as are more distressing, a, a group of doctors were given patient files that showed conditions suggesting heart disease. And they were asked to diagnose the condition, which they did successfully for everybody and they were asked to recommend treatment. The doctors who had taken the IAT, the Implicit Association Test, and who had higher levels of implicit bias were less likely to recommend the gold standard treatment, thrombolosis, for black patients than they were for white patients. There was a link between, and, and none of these doctors had explicit reports of negative stereotypes, and I don't, again, I don't, think the, I don't think that group of doctors knew that they were doing this, and in fact, we have great proof that that's so, not just me speculating. One group of doctors in the study, with all of the instructions that were given, and you guys have done exercises before where you're, people drone on with instructions, and you're kind of barely hearing it. Part of the droning instructions for one group of doctors included the phrase, it has been found that race sometimes affects diagnosis and treatment recommendations. That was one phrase among like 25, make sure you, know, you put your name in the left-hand corner, like all the kind of mundane stuff that we always hear. They weren't hit over the head with it. It was just part of the background instructions. That group 
was race equal. Everybody who had the diagnosis got the gold standard treatment because the doctors were put on notice of the risk and they self-corrected. They self-corrected. We can self-correct if we know we have to. So love that study. Hate that study because it's terrifying. Love that study because it gives us hope. Native Americans, we have so little, so, so again, I, I, I have become much more conscious. I was a civil rights lawyer at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Most of the work I did, I did was with respect to representing African American communities. I have been accused of being part of the binary and I'm really working against that because I know it's not the world we live in anymore. And when I looked at the data about King County, I realized this is a community that has not a large Native population, but a significant population and some challenges. So we need to think about what's happening with Native American kids, what's happening with Native American families, we are learning through the little bit of work that's been done that yes, there are implicit attitudes toward Native Americans, not much is known, but the attitudes exist and so the work has to be done. Implicit association in Asian Americans. There is often the assumption, you know, the model minority myth. Things are going great for Asian Americans. We see the data that with respect to home ownership and you know, school achievement and, uh, and, and income rates, you know, there's some good data to suggest that. But we also know from some very powerful studies like the study done by my colleague Jerry Kong, who's pictured there, that there are some implicit associations made about Asian Americans that can absolutely affect and constrict what their opportunities are. So Jerry's study uh, involved people listening to an identical deposition, groups of prospective jurors, one group thought it was done by someone who was white, white guy, one group thought it was done by someone who was Asian American. Guess what? The people who thought it was done by the white guy thought he was assertive and that he was helpful and that he was friendly and he would represent my interests and they would hire him and recommend him. Not so much. Same deposition, done by an Asian American guy. The positive stereotypes about Asian Americans may, may, you want, may make you want to have an Asian American engineer or doctor, but they may prevent us from seeing the capacities and potentials of an Asian American litigator. So being cognizant that any kind of stereotype or association can be constricting or limiting to an individual is crucial. Now here's an interesting example of how we know implicit bias exists and one way of making it go away. Some of you may be aware of this. Uh, for a long time, orchestras were largely male and the women who were musicians were concerned that it was implicit, you know, essentially bias against, you know, gender bias. So they insisted on screens or the, the, the sort of the, the way of testing for this and hopefully remedying it was to put screens in front of the uh, auditions. Oh my gosh. Um, and what happened when they put the screens uh, in front and they put a rubber mat so that no one could hear the click, click, click of the high heels uh, was a dramatic increase in the number of women. Okay, I'm gonna have to move very, very fast and I apologize, it's hard for me to do this quickly. Um, confirmation bias, we saw this in the Tom Meyer study, it's seeing what we expect to see. And when we go through and do the, you know, do the small group workshops, I can explain and go through in more detail anything anyone wants to hear about any of this because it's way too much information to be throwing at you, but we do want to give you a chance to be able to think through the implications of all this for uh, your, your work and yourself. I'm going to move a little quickly. This is crucial though. Implicit bias is not only manifested in decisions it's also manifested in body language and behavior. So an implicitly biased person will give different verbal, nonverbal cues, they'll stand less close, they'll use less eye contact, the conversations will be shorter than someone who has no implicit bias or isn't implicitly biased. Think about the effect of that in so many dimensions of the work that all of you do. People can sense it and it's scary, it's off-putting. We tend to think of nonverbal cues as being more real and more accurate, and we're moved by them often more than we are someone's actual words. Okay, so part of the crucial message for all this is we can't just say, just quit talking about race and then it'll go away, because all of the evidence suggests that because of the associations, because of the stereotypes that are there, that we've all imbibed through the culture, we have to be race aware in order to recognize that we need to be mindful, be cautious, and figure out when race may be affecting our behavior. Um, again, 
can't do this one, it's really fun. It's, it's an example, like the doctor example, of when race is made salient, um, in the second scenario, uh, the person who said, how dare you talk about, oops, actually I missed that one up. Okay, we'll, we'll do that one later. So, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, okay, so implicit bias, as we discussed, interacts with the external structures and networks, and the combination of them give us very powerful cues and examples of why we have some of the disparities that we do have. And again, we can talk more about these uh, either during questions and answers or uh, after, um, you know, in, in, in interpersonal conversations. This is just an example. Neighborhood segregation, there's an incredibly powerful amount of data suggesting that for many whites, there is this negative association and set of assumptions about neighborhoods in which there's a high proportion of people of color, this has also been tested. Same picture, same conditions, put a figure of a black person and a figure of a white person, and people looking at that picture and conditions will make all sorts of different assumptions about the quality of the neighborhood when they see just a single picture of a, of a person of color affecting where people live, where people think are safe. What can be done? This is obviously most crucial. So, as I mentioned, there is work that is now available on actually reducing bias. And I will share the very detailed set of training instructions that were created by Patricia Devine at the University of Wisconsin. They have been very, very successful, re resulting in reduced bias, increased awareness of uh, discrimination, and most excitingly in some ways, increased enthusiasm about interracial interactions. We're not going to just get rid of the biases. That's a goal to get rid of the biases altogether, but in the meantime, as we've talked about, or as I've talked about, we want to make sure that the biases aren't affecting behavior. So part of what I hope our group discussions can be about is bias overrides. What are the kinds of actions that you think are occurring within the work that you do that may implicate bias and think through what are the interventions, what are the ways of being mindful, like the doctors were, like the jurors can be, like the you know, orchestra conductors were, to prevent the implicit bias from leaking into decisions and behavior. So these are the four, essentially the sort of, you know, in, a, in, in four uh, quick hits, promoting counter-stereotypic images, promoting individuation, seeing, recognizing we're not all lumpish groups, we are different. This can be very difficult for whites to do, particularly with African Americans and other groups of color because we're taught we're supposed to be colorblind. If you're colorblind, you're not supposed to see race. If you don't see race, how do you individuate? Because you're too busy not seeing. And so that's one of the sort of very challenging but crucial steps that we need to learn to take in order to break up these generalized associations. Empathic perspective taking, going back to Ferguson for a second. There's one way of thinking about it, which is, why didn't you know, Michael Brown simply act respectfully in the first place? Why didn't the community simply accept the uh, grand jury decision in the first place? If, you know, when things like this happen with whites, that's what I would do. That's not empathic perspective taking. That's thinking, given my life experience, this seems like it doesn't make sense. But then moving into a place where you think, what does it feel like to be the young guy who every, you know, when walks by a white woman, she goes like this. What does that feel like? What does it feel like to be the mother or the father of the young man? And why is it so important with law enforcement? Because there's often the adage, well, there's more deaths that happen, you know, in domestic violence, there's more deaths that happen in neighborhoods between kids. That's true in both. Domestic violence is incredibly, you know, sort of the risks are greater. There are more murders between you know, groups in neighborhoods then between police, but when it's our public safety system, it feels different, and we know that. So again, that empathic perspective taking that can help us bridge some of these divides. And finally, most importantly, the, you know, the allies you saw this morning on this stage, that does so much work, very quickly. So this is outcomes, they were fabulous, really exciting. I have to get to the rebound effects, and I know they're going to shut me down in a second appropriately because I always talk too long. I have to get to the rebound effects because they're real. Racial anxiety, the worrier concern 
that people have during interracial interactions, and stereotype threat, which is the concern that we're going to confirm a negative stereotype about our group, can be as harmful, as powerful, and as likely to lead to harmful outcomes as implicit bias. And so we have to make sure that being mindful that we have biases doesn't lead particularly whites to go into white liberal guilt overload. Because liberal guilt is, is mine. That's, that's about me. And it shouldn't be about me, right? It should be about what my behavior is and how I'm responding and how I'm thinking externally. And so racial anxiety is experienced by people of different races and ethnicities, but differently. So if you're a person of color, your anxiety is you're going to be you know, met with discrimination or bias. If you're white, your anxiety is that you're going to be perceived as racist. And it turns out that the effects of racial anxiety for whites look a lot like the behavioral effects of bias. So the racially anxious teacher behaves somewhat similarly in her dynamics with kids as the bias teacher. So the anxiety isn't the answer. Being worried about your racism isn't the answer. It's doing the work to get to a different place. The child feels like an outsider with that kind of behavior, whether it's a result of bias or a result of anxiety. The child is on the hurting end either way. Racial anxiety's effects on the brain, we've all felt anxiety, right? Your heart rate goes up, your stress level goes up, you know, different people react differently. It's powerful, and it actually diminishes our cognitive capacities. So moving past that anxiety into a different place is crucial to get this work done. So, frankly, part of the most successful efforts to reduce racial anxiety is increasing interracial contact a lot. And so seeing this very, very diverse room is fabulous. Having all of you work together and be open to the importance of your relationships, having you know, integrated leadership ideally, workforces, all of that does huge amounts of work. For the whites in the room, we have to get over the idea that we can be colorblind because we can't. And it's wildly irritating when we try to be. Because then we say things like, I just don't see you as black. And we don't understand why that's not seen as a compliment. And it's obviously not our attempt to say, because if I did, I wouldn't like you. It's a kind of, you know, I'm see we're seeing each other's humanity. But part of someone's humanity may be their racial identity. That's not the racism part. So we have to work through that one. Um, promoting the importance and the sort of fabulousness of diversity actually helps both groups. And it, in fact, it's true that diverse work groups are more innovative, they are more creative, they lead to better outcomes in virtually every field that research has been done. Very quickly, stereotype threat is related to racial anxiety, but it's slightly different. It's the worry that people have that you'll confirm a negative stereotype, and it essentially acts as a headwind. And this is important in workplaces, because if someone's racial anxiety, or stereotype threat rather, is, is triggered, their work will be less good. And it's not them, it's the context. Their work in another context would be better. If stereotype threat is, is triggered in schools, as it so often is, kids' work will be less good. And look how we see this. G girls who are told that girls and boys or men and women aren't as uh, strong at math, they're the green ones on the left side. Their performance in a, math, a hard math test far less strong than when they're told that men and women are equal in math. Dramatic difference. And you'll also see the men get a stereotype lift. They do better when they think, we kind of rock at this. So we want to create a condition. We want the men to do as well as they can, of course. And if we can create that lift in other ways, awesome. But we don't want it to happen at the expense of the women. This was the first study that was done, and it shows the same thing for African Americans and white students in a verbal GRE. Here's an interesting one. White men can be subject to stereotype threat, too. White men just told, told to take the test of their math ability, do really well. Told to test their math ability against Asian Americans, oops. White men told that there's a, a putting green where they're being tested on their spatial relations, do really well. White men told that they're being tested on their natural athletic ability, not so much. So this is something that can affect us all. And 
white stereotype threat, the fear of confirming racism, is something that leads to very unhelpful conduct. And I'll basically end very shortly. These are the studies that I referenced earlier where white teachers are giving inadequate and less feedback to students if they're African American or Latino. Interestingly, if their teachers are in a school where they feel protected and supported by their principals and their colleagues, they do give the same level of feedback to black students but they don't to Latino students. What does that tell us? With respect to the black students, it's actually not implicit bias. It's not assumptions about capacity. It's worry that they're gonna be seen as racist. With respect to the Latino students, it is implicit bias. It is assumptions about capacity. So the reason I emphasize this, and I promise I'll sit down and we'll create opportunities for all of you to work together. The reason I emphasis, emphasize this is in order to identify and figure out what's happening in any of our workplaces or communities or lives and how race or ethnicity or gender are playing a role, we have to know what the catalyst is. It's not always bias. Sometimes it's these other phenomena, and if we don't know which one it is, we might get the intervention wrong. And we need to get the interventions right, because that's what's gonna change the behavior, and that's what's so crucial. So finally, recognizing that your IAT score or any bias you might have or any challenges that any of us may face in identity matters, they're not fixed. We can move them, they are malleable. There's a bunch of institutional interventions, and again, I can share this with all of you in great detail, and you're actually getting a wonderful detailed guide that will provide this information to you. There's all sorts of different ways to alter these dynamics, and we can talk about those. The work we'd like you to do now, and I promise we'll give you a chance to come up and ask questions because I've thrown so much information at you, is to start to have some conversations just here in this room at your tables, or mix up tables a little bit if you feel like the tables are insufficiently, you know, sort of structured to have enough people or, you know, kind of whatever their concerns are. Ideally, we'll have interracial groups at tables. That would be best. But talk about whether you've ever experienced people making assumptions about you that aren't true because everyone probably will have had an experience like that. The experiences may well be far more profound if you're from a non-dominant group, sort of the equivalent of, you know, when kids get together, some of them will have a parent who was killed. Some of them, when they're talking about their worst tragedy, some will have had a parent who was killed. Some will have parents are divorced. Some will have had a sibling who, you know, has a serious disability. And my own daughter's worst tragedy when they had that conversation in fifth grade was when her hamster died. And she was really glad she went last because it wasn't that she wasn't heartbroken when her hamster died, she was, but when she heard about the parent dying, she realized, yes, I have my pain, but my pain in contrast and my experiences in contrast to some of my peers is different. And that doesn't mean mine isn't worth paying attention to, but she had some humility about the difference in the experience. So everyone will have had experiences, but some people at your table may have had experiences that are far more profound. And being cognizant that that's so doesn't mean you shouldn't talk about your own experience, because part of this is trying to figure out how are we, you know, sort of as people having some of these same experiences, but still recognizing that there may be difference. How do you handle that experience? Perhaps people have resilience and navigation strategies that will be helpful, because there's an enormous amount that people can do to develop resilience. Then ideally we'll move to, you've just heard about three phenomena, some you were maybe more familiar with than others, and again, I'll be racing around the room trying to be helpful. How might any of these be playing a role in the work that you do? What do you think? Some of these may be unfamiliar, you know, some of these may be new and you might not have thought about them before. How might they be affecting what you do? And with a little bit of time we have left, brainstorm, and then we'll have a chance to ask questions Thank you so much for your attention. I'm sorry I raced through the end. I get all excited about my stories. And I really look forward to this session. Um, I felt somewhat self-conscious about sitting in too much because you are all fellow employees and I'm obviously the outsider, but one table was, uh, was very kind and let me sit in on their discussion. 
and it was very, very powerful. And experiences that people have had in their lives, both inside and outside, or bo rather both outside and inside uh, the county government were discussed. And again, there obviously are extraordinarily positive aspirations. As we know, there's obviously an extraordinary amount of work that needs to be done. And it's amazing to have people in this room here, and I uh, value and am so appreciative of the attention and the engagement that I saw on the tables, uh, the, again, the table that I sat with and the tables that I saw. Um, to the extent that we only have a little bit of time where I can in any way be helpful to you myself, I would love to be. And so if you have questions, we have microphones on either side of the room. And again, I know I threw an enormous amount of science um, at you. And I know particularly because everyone's hearing all of this information through the lens of a lot of painful experiences, challenges, you know, sort of particular issues that they're uh, within their own lives, within their own communities, sometimes the science may seem a little abstract. But to the extent that the science may be helpful, that is the goal. And as I mentioned earlier, we do have, or the, the, the working uh, team has worked with me to put together a guide that includes links to videos, that includes links to information, and I will provide that and more. Um, so again, thank you so much for both your attention in the initial hour and the honesty and the candor and the bravery that people brought to their discussions. And if there are some questions, I would be thrilled to answer them. Sir. Uh, thank you for this uh, forum. It was, it was great. So my name is Darrell Rogers. I work in public health. And my question has to do with, I, I'm really happy to see these different um, coping mechanisms and ways to identify our own internal biases. But what I found was not mentioned was the emotions and the anger when you're dealing with that situation head on. And then how that being part of the limbic system <laughs> can override quite a bit of the logic and how to kind of deal with that, you know, and, and, and recenter yourself to try to work with the situation. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Rogers. It's a, it, so to the extent that not everyone heard the questions, Mr. Rogers noted that the description of the sciences and the, some of the tools was helpful, but that what was not mentioned was the emotions and the anger and, the ex, and, and what the toll of the experience of dealing with the phenomena on the receiving side, if I'm understanding your questions properly, what that feels like and, and kind of how to confront that. And it, again, it's, it's a terrific question. And there is actually a growing body of social science that both essentially um, maps the toll. And as I think your question suggests, the toll of being on the receiving end of discrimination is a powerful explanation for many of the health disparity outcomes that we see. Being on the receiving end of discrimination, again, the stress level and the literal physical toll of dealing with that day in, day out in different phenomena, if it's in your workplace, if it's in your community, it is profound. And part of the work, you're in public health, part of the work, obviously, that we need to do in providing public, in providing care is, first of all, to begin to have that as part of the set of, of standard questions that people are asked, right? Because to the extent that part of the causal, well, among the causal mechanisms for some of the health uh, crises that people are experiencing may well be discrimination, that has to be part of what is known in helping to have them receive the treatment that will actually firmly address all that they're experiencing. So there are, there are linkages to a whole array of Again, heart conditions and, you know, again, just a, a wide variety of, um, of, of conditions are affected ex explicitly, and this has been measured by discrimination. There also are some terrific resiliency tools, and this is always difficult because the last thing that sort of as a governmental entity we should want to do is put the burden on those who are essentially on the receiving end to do more work. That should not be the goal. The, we, you know, ideally, we want the institutional interventions 
to prevent the experiences and the discrimination, you know, discriminatory behavior from occurring. At the same time, we know institutional work doesn't successfully uh, result in change, you know, in a day. And so part of what I will share are a set of resiliency recommendations that people can use actively to give us all agency, to give everyone here agency to the extent that any one of you is experiencing uh, exp discrimination or, you know, kind of bias of a sort that is putting that toll on you. I will, I'll share some of those resiliency tools because it, these, you know, as, as my father would say, this is a multi-dimensional protracted struggle and we need to have, you know, we need to have streams of, uh, of tools available at each place in that struggle and so individuals absolutely should have access to uh, that which science suggests can be helpful and so I will share that as well. So thank you so much for the question, Mr. Rogers. Yeah. Good morning, Rachel. Thank you. Um, my name is Carol Allen, and I, too, work for public health. So my question is, as I look around the room, you're kind of preaching to the choir. So how do we actually, you have any tools for us to actually get the people that, um, that will actually help and learn additional information that can kind of help affect change in the workplace, especially for people of color. Um, we have quite a few issues going on in public health, at least that I know of, um, where people of color are being continually oppressed. And I don't see any of those people in the room. I mean, the people, you know, I don't see those managers here. So, and we, you know, as, as for me, I've been here, done this. So at some point, we need to move forward. So how do we get the people that really need to be in the room, in the room? So we need some tools. I'm just saying. So, so thank you. Uh, tell me your last name, please, Ms. Allen. Uh, Ms. Allen, thank you so much for that comment. And I did hear that comment from some of the folks I spoke to at the tables. And I will say from my experience in working with other institutions, there is only one tool for that, Ms. Allen, and that's that the leadership require it. And I think what probably is the case is there is concern on the part of the leadership that making sessions like this mandatory may backfire because if people don't want to be here, they won't be open to the information. I will say that my experience is that people, you know, we are all um, affected dramatically and our behavior is responsive to that which is required of us. And I think in some sense, hopefully the leadership will have some, will both respect the experience of the people who are undergoing, you know, present day uh, discrimination that obviously the leadership doesn't want to be occurring and by respecting that, that requires ensuring that the people who, you know, sort of are part of that dynamic be present to participate in the discussion. But what I will also say is this, the, the mind sciences do seem to have opened up a space for a conversation about race that didn't used to seem possible. I don't get, you know, and again, it's, it's, it's maybe a little premature. There may be some people who are, have been rolling their eyes the entire time I've been up here and are just being very clever about it, so I can't see it, and it's a big room. Um, but like I said, I've spent the last six months going around doing judicial trainings and those have, many of those have been mandatory. And I have had judges in the room who come in. And by the end, and I'll, I'll also say, I'm usually gi I'm, I'm given several hours so we can really work through a lot of information. And I've had people come up and say, I was really skeptical. I've had diversity training since I was you know, 30 years old, and I can't tell you how sick of them I am. Uh, but hearing about this science has made me rethink some of what I assume to be true. And so I do think that, and there is research to suggest that there is a potential for positive change that can follow from a discussion that provides an explanation that otherwise seems elusive. I, uh, one of the things I didn't get a chance to talk about quite, in a, uh, quite as much as I would like is the phenomena of in-group preference. So, Social scientists have concluded that a, a considerable amount of the uh, bias-related dynamics that occur presently are not animus. 
You know, they're not hostility, they're not hatred, and they're not even, as I've mentioned several times, the conscious um, adherence or agreement with the negative stereotypes. And so because those things aren't present, for a so as a white person, for white people who don't have animus, don't have hostility, you know, don't think the stereotypes, don't agree with the stereotypes for the most part, the feeling, I'm not racist, feels very real. And so the suggestion that one might nonetheless have to grapple with racial dynamics, I was like, what are you talking about? I did that. But what, when there is this in-group preference, that again, is often automatic, people don't know they have it, that accumulated over time, the in-group preference accumulated over time, the implicit biases accumulated, accumulated over time are unbelievably impactful, right? So if you have just a little bit of a benefit of the doubt given to someone from your own group, if you have just a little bit of the, you know, over, eval you know, sort of the, the over scrutiny of someone from another group, accumulating all those together helps explain why we're still like this, even without the animus. And so again, helping people understand how they can be sort of good people who want to do the right things, but nonetheless their behavior isn't as consistent with that as they would like. And that there are steps that they can take to change that, and that we all need to be part of this can, 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 ha can help. Um, Ma'am, I didn't mean to cut off your question. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more question. This side of the room is like, oh, I, we have to go to this side of the room. We do two more questions since people are standing up. Yes. Um, so but my question um, was sparked by Mr. Rogers' question, and I feel like the science that you've presented today is very compelling and hopeful and interesting, um, but I wonder how do, how do you make space for the emotional aspect of this work? How do you make space for the anger? So, I mean, in this environment, I'm sure there's a lot of people who inside have a lot of emotion and anger and sadness and fear, and that needs to be raised, and we need to go, I feel like we need to go through a process of, of hearing it and having the space for it, but how do, we, how do we do that as a workplace, and how do we do that so that, that dialogue is constructive, but also healing? So, the Within Our Lifetime network that the county has officially joined um, does have a facilitator guide that essentially I've used as a jumping off point for the guide that I've prepared with the, the working group here. And that, that guide does, I think, provide the beginning. Now, you're right, the, the Within Our Lifetime Network is, in some sense, a community, is, is initially presumed to be within a, a kind of bodies, within communities. And you're both right, Mr. Rogers and and Ms. Harris are both, of course, right. Emotion in the workplace is far more fraught and far more difficult. And you have power dynamics, and you have you know, bosses, managers, and people who are managed by them. And it is, that is uh, a, a challenge that is different than the challenge of people who are part of neighborhoods or part of you know, church groups or others, where essentially it, there may be a greater feeling of safety in sharing the, those emotions and sharing the anger but again, as, as was suggested by a few of the questions, you know, what if the manager who you think has been biased toward you is sitting across the room or the table? That creates a very different dynamic, and I think that's where um, essentially sort of the, the uh, guidelines for the engagement and the creation of a place where while constructive, you know, sort of essentially while obviously, you know, we can't have people sort of screaming at each other in the workplace because that isn't, is, is difficult to manage, but recognizing there will be anger, recognizing there will be emotion, and recognizing that there may have to be a reassessment of what a, whether or not a past dynamic was okay is going to have to be part of the work. Uh, I have been part of a few sessions like that where multi-hour sessions with, you know, within particular workplaces where we've tried to work through with facilitators available um, and with essentially people being very candid, you know, outside obviously the office, being very candid about what their experiences were and then bringing those to um, you know, sort of essentially having employees and managers 
initially have separate conversations, have the employees feel absolutely free to share everything that they've ever experienced that they think may be related to bias, accumulating and aggregating that information, sharing it with the managers, hearing the managers, sort of giving them a chance to respond to that and talk about it, and then working through a set of recommended new practices. That was successful in one institution I worked with. It was a sm smaller than this, obviously. Um, but I think that there are, you know, th there are methods to create space for that emotional component of all this, which is so powerful and which is going to be present while using the constructive kind of forward-looking tools as a place where everyone wants to go. I think you're the final question, sir. Um, it's not really a question. Or a comment. Or it, it's more of an observation. And you know, my, you know, being a person of color and having been educated in basically a, um, you know, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant system, and, and I mean that from the perspective of small private schools, et cetera, um, raised Catholic, went to Protestant schools. So that was, that, that added to the, you know, in, in addition to the racial issues, you had other issues. But the concern that I have, and this is what I've learned the last few years uh, about race, is that race is a tool that's used by the white power structure to maintain its power and position. We're not really going to fully understand why racism is an issue if we don't have an honest discussion about how we got here, about the power structure, why it exists, where it came from, how did it become to exist, how does that colonial, that colo the colonial power structure exist today, and how that power structure uses race to divide people, so to maintain the power and to maintain their position. Because that's, we have to start there before we, you know, that has to be part of the discussion for us to really make change. Um, I deal with it every day. I see it every day. We see it in the media. You know, I see it, I love sports. I love baseball. I see how Hispanic names are just brutalized in pronunciation. It's offensive to me. You know, yet, you know, white European names pronounced perfectly. There's, a, a, there's, there's an importance to do that. I see it in our institutions, that some of which you've touched upon in some of your slides about the, the inst how the, the policies and structures are set up. But those policies, those structures, those institutions were set up by white colonial powers that have transformed and have learned what you're talking about, the social science. These guys have their social scientists as well formulating formulating their strategies on how to divide people, how to maintain their power and position. You know, I, I think the point I'm trying to make, folks, is that, yes, we're the choir, so to speak. Not all of us here, probably, but most of us. But we cannot fully end racism until we really fully understand our history, how we got here, how it started, and, and the tools that those folks in power are using, the same tools that we're trying to use to change our behavior, they're using the same tools to maintain, to divide us, and maintain their power and position. And they've learned it, and, and the only way we're going to do that is if we, if we educate ourselves on our history, because we don't get it in our, in our education system. The education system we get, the history we get, is the white supremacist narrative, manifest destiny. That's the, that's the underlying current of our system today. And until we recognize that, we're not really going to be able to have a, an honest, full discussion about race in, in, on our planet and how to, and, and how to eradicate it. Okay. So, 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 so thank you so much. Uh, yes, sir. Can I, can I give one co comment and response and then, uh, so uh, two, two different points. Uh, first of all, obviously, incredibly powerful, Im Im crucial to think about, and obviously every, um, we are where we are, it cannot be denied because of a set of institutionalized practices largely predicated on race. That is absolutely true, and it, again, it cannot be denied. Um, there is also, in social science, 
a phenomena that I didn't describe, and I'll explain why in a second, called racial threat and group-based dominance. That is exactly what you just described, which is there certainly continue to be people for whom the idea of essentially being white and losing dominance is terrifying and unacceptable. And that's true. There are people who are in that mindset consciously. And the people who are in that mindset consciously are engaged in uh, you know, a set of actions to try and maintain that power. So you are absolutely right about that. I think the question is how to grapple with the different places that people, where people are that make change most possible. And to the extent that there's sort of, on the one hand, you have this you know, group who are still rooted in this place of racial threat, um, a, my colleague Alexis McGill-Johnson would say, against that group, one needs to learn to play racial chess and not checkers. And there's got to be a very sophisticated strategy, and you alluded to this, sir, in response to that. When we're talking about people, most of whom are not in that place, who actually don't want to be in that place, who want to be in environments and communities and neighborhoods and schools and workplaces that are successfully integrated, beginning with a recognition of shared humanity and a shared goal of creating a successfully integrated world, ideally will bring us to a place where we can go into that deeper understanding of history to get why our structures and why our, the systems currently in place do have these inequalities, but it can, that can be a tough place to start starting with history. Again, as a, as a professor, as an academic, every single article I ever wrote started with the history because that's where my own understanding starts. But what I found is talking, you know, sharing that work with, you know, students of goodwill, they, you know, they, this is a typical response that you'll hear. And I, I think this, I understand this, you know, sort of my relatives came to this country, you know, from Poland in 1920. I feel like I'm being blamed. Now, I think there's excellent logical arguments to say it's not about your being blamed, but I think to the extent that we're talking about the emotion and the, the possibilities of having a constructive conversation, beginning with history can lead to so much, um, so much difference in sort of responsibility that it can take longer to get to the point where we say, where are we now? How are people behaving now? What can we do to change behaviors now that are having harmful effects now? And how do we then recognize where the, the, the schema and the stereotypes that we have that lead to those behaviors come from? That often leads, you know, once people realize, I have done things. You know, I've had judges say this, oh my God, I have, you know, I, I took the implicit association test and I have preference. Does this mean that I've made decisions about kids? And, you know, the tears in the eyes, but not the tears of guilt and avoidance, the tears of responsibility and I now need to do something different. The recognition of the need to do something different and the beginning of the efforts to do something different in you know, according, sort of in my experience and according to a lot of the, the work that has been done, will lead to the ability to look backward and see how the conditions arose that wasn't present before people truly understood it's also about the now. So I, I completely agree that to really understand how we got to where we are, we have to understand history. The social science suggests that if we begin at that place, it is more difficult to create the context in which we get the current behavior change that frankly we need in order to pre prevent the harm that we're seeing right now. So I think we're agreeing about the broad picture, but we may have some different strategic theories about what will lead to what we, I think we all agree needs to happen to the extent that we're saying this is the choir. Matthias, you tell me what I, whether I can keep, we've got a couple of hands up and I'm, I'm at your disposal. Um, very quickly, I know we're running late here. Uh, my name is Anthony Hapasari. Uh, 1966, my dad uh, 
designed uh, the first uh, curriculum for minority cultures uh, for the high school level in Washington State. And uh, as a little kid, I grew up knowing who Cesar Chavez and Medgar Evers were and Malcolm X at a time when that wasn't that common in suburbia. But my basic point, my observation is we're all public servants here. Our, our job is to serve the citizens of King County to the best way that we can. And I specifically work for the King County uh, Parks Division and uh, I see it as part of my role that the people that use our facilities uh, you know, feel good while they're there, feel welcomed, and have a positive experience. Um, I think a large part of what we're talking about that hasn't been touched on is uh, a lack of education. Um, a lot of people I know do not approach minorities because they feel uncomfortable, not because of bias per se, I believe, but because they don't know what to say, they don't know the social experience of the people, and my advice to everyone is educate yourself. There's a world of difference between the uh, social experience and history of an Ethiopian, uh, somebody from Kenya, uh, someone from South Africa. Um, just this last summer, very quickly, I met a gentleman from Senegal with my two daughters who were adopted from India at the Maple Valley uh, celebration. And I spoke to him in French for about 10 minutes, and I know something about the history and the culture and the sure, music of Senegal. These are powerful stories that I've seen yeah. people leave, and I think the leadership needs to describe Okay, the next sorry step. very much, but my point is, please, uh, you know, educate yourself about the people that we are serving and their background. So we just want to thank all of you for coming. We appreciate the time you're taking out of your work day to really discuss these important topics. Um, and we understand that these are difficult subjects and there's a lot of emotion around them, but we appreciate your commitment to this. Um, and going forward, uh, John's going to share with you a few tools that you can take back to your offices. Okay. The first one want to give, uh, give a round of applause for Rachel for coming up. <laughs> we'll to you. I'd like to also thank the planning committee for putting this together, and I'd also like to thank you for attending. In follow-up, please note that we are not done. This is not over. Um, one thing, you, if you notice, you have index cards on your tables. If you have any questions that you were, if you wanted to get out, you didn't have the time, or you didn't feel comfortable presenting it in this environment, write them down on the index cards and leave them on your table. We'll make sure that we get them to Rachel, and we'll get that information, her response to those questions posted online, okay? In addition to that, um, one thing we want to do is to ensure that each of us take ownership and continue the dialogue and the work towards building a culture of equity in King County. Uh, right now, you know, as a county, we join the Within Our Lifetime campaign. We can do it as individuals. This is a website right there. There's also information on the program that was handed out. Um, there is a Yammer group. Some of us are participating in Yammer. Um, there is an equity and social justice group within Yammer. We'd like to continue some dialogue there. Um, feel free. Open up the dialogue. We've got to keep this conversation going. We've got to keep pushing this forward. And uh, as, as well, you've got your ESJ, IBT, and planning committee members. That information is also available in your program. Um, presentation and other resources can also be found on the Equity and Social Justice website. That link is on your program and is also on this slide. Again, thank you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. We wish you happy holidays.